Hello YouTube! This week we are driving out to Fire Island in Long Island. And in order not to get burned by the sun in July, I wanted to do this video as early in the morning as I can and check out the daily traffic going into the city for work on the other side of the highway. <laughs> Poor souls, I feel their pain. For me, the only drawback was the direct sun in my eyes. But you know what? By now, a Taylor Swift song came on the radio so I was jamming away to that. Now, the main place I want to show you is the Fire Island Lighthouse. However, Fire Island stretches for about 31 miles or so and has numerous communities on it. And so I want to show you a little of that as well. It is a place I will certainly return to in the future as there is so much more to show you. But for this trip, I walked through only three of these communities. Kimset, Saltier and Fair Harbor to give you an idea of how it looks like. If you want to visit these communities, you can take various ferries or do what I did and drive through Robert Moses State Park where you will pass by the water tower. Now this also is pretty cool, but it's a topic for another video sometime in the future. You also see a radio antenna in the frame. Again, cool history behind that, but that will go along with the water tower. I cannot give away all the good stuff in one single video, but this is the first state park on Long Island. When it was opened in 1908, it was called Fire Island State Park, and only later was renamed Robert Moses State Park. When you are in the state park, Park in Field 5, which is the closest to the lighthouse and to the Fire Island communities, if you would like to walk there. Now, if I could only find a parking spot at 8 o'clock in the morning, huh, that's a tough one. But since I'm already here, let me give you a sneak peek at the Robert Moses State Park Beach. I like these sort of carpets that they have laid out in few places which will take you almost to the edge of the beach by the water. It's so much easier to walk on them compared to the sand itself. Honestly, it's a beautiful beach. Here we have a small corner with a pirate flag if you want to pretend to go back to the 1700s and roleplay a pirate captain, many of whom use this symbol on their ships, by the way. But you know what, all of this gorgeous beach and water to look at and relax and yet someone positioned their chair away from everything and basically to just stare at that flag. It was probably Sunday night and they were just prepping themselves for work on Monday. Okay, so let's walk to our lighthouse. But before we do that, I just want to show you this. That day was almost 90 degrees outside and not a single, not even the tiniest little cloud in sight. So very quickly, this trip turned from sightseeing and fun to survival mode. But you know what? It was so worth it. If you want to walk to the lighthouse, I, you know what? I didn't look at the distance, but it's not that far. Certainly, it's not more than a mile. And as you see, it's really easy and enjoyable path as you walk on the boardwalk and you can enjoy the views on the side. About halfway to the lighthouse, you will come across a road, which is the road that vehicles can use to enter Fire Island communities. But that's for service and emergency vehicles only. And there's also a few residents that live there year round, but very few. Most homes are rented or summer homes. 
So except for these few little exceptions, vehicles are not allowed on Fire Island. Before we continue further, there is a platform to the left which you can walk to and get a better view of the island. So let me give you like a 360 view from here. But of course, this will not be the view that you will see from the top of the lighthouse. Can you go on top of it? Yes, you can. Will I? Yep. But wait a minute. Didn't you say you're afraid of heights in your previous videos? Absolutely. And you know what? It's a few days later and I'm still trying to get over the trauma. But anything for YouTube. The lighthouse began operating in 1858 and was decommissioned in 1973. And the light from the top of the lighthouse was transferred to the water tower that you saw a few minutes earlier. However, shortly afterwards, the Fire Island Lighthouse Preservation Society was created. They raised over a million dollars to relight and restore the lighthouse, and they did. It opened back up in 1986, and the society maintains the lighthouse until today, with the light still serving as an official aid in navigation. Now, I cannot stress enough how helpful and nice the volunteers here are to answer any and all of your questions. Now, this is not my first time to the lighthouse. I have been here before three, maybe four times that I can think of. And I already know some background information about the place and the lighthouse, but some information that I will tell you in this video also comes from the volunteers that I have spoken with and some of the numerous information boards uh, around the lighthouse. So I cannot take all the credit for everything you will hear in this video. I definitely have to give a shout out to the volunteers for taking me to the side and providing me with some really interesting information. But before you get to the lighthouse, you will pass by what's called a lens building. On the side of the building, you will see the remains of the first and the original lighthouse. This here was the second lighthouse, the replacement. The original lighthouse was completed in 1826 and it was much smaller. Its light was only visible for about 14 miles off the shores. And because of that, ships continued to wreck. So the current lighthouse was built almost twice as tall with the light visible from more than 20 miles off the coast. Another amazing piece of information is that this spot used to be the edge of the island when the lighthouse was built in 1826. Everything that you saw so far in this video that I walked through, including the Robert Moses State Park, was really created afterwards by sand deposits extending the shoreline for about 5 miles. But it all came after the 1820s. Inside of the lens house, we have the original lens of the lighthouse. Check this beauty out. Look how the curves of the glass reveal the light bulb inside. Pretty cool. So this is the first order Frenzel lens, which was designed by a French physicist, Augustin Frenzel, where these curved glass segments angle the light outward. And look at this point. It seems like it is not aligned, the top and the bottom portions, but actually this is done on purpose because it creates these unique lines as you see here on the wall. And this would be the first thing that the captain of a ship would see, followed by the beacon, hence knowing exactly which lighthouse this was. Until 1938, the light was on using oil lamps. First, whale oil, but then other oils were used as well, like vegetable oil, for example. That means the light keeper had to carry gallons of oil to the top, like five gallon buckets. Not an easy task. Then electricity powered the lighthouse starting in 1938. The other thing you see in the lens house is the other different types of lenses as they come in different sizes, referred to as orders. Hence, this lens that I was showing you is the first order, meaning the largest standard size lens. The smallest lens would be the fourth order. In front of the building, there's a portion of a wrecked ship, 
and there is some speculation that this might indeed be a piece of Savannah. Now, Savannah was the first steamship to cross the Atlantic Ocean in 1819. However, just shortly after that, in 1821, it wrecked off the shore of Long Island. This piece that you see was washed ashore after a tropical storm in 2022, and now, more than 200 years later, it's very much so possible that we have a piece of that historic ship here on display. Lighthouses in New York became very important because of the Erie Canal, which opened in 1825. It connected New York City with the Midwest, and it really made New York City the most important harbor in America. Lots and lots of ships, which meant safety had to be improved, and hence more dependence on lighthouses like this one. In fact, the first thing that most ships coming to New York City from Europe would see would be the light from this lighthouse before they saw anything else like the Statue of Liberty. Therefore, one can say that this was the light which was the beacon of freedom and hope for many immigrants coming to the United States in search of a better life. By 1890s, each lighthouse received a particular color and design. Like you see here, two black stripes and two white stripes. These are day markers, so mariners can distinguish one lighthouse from another during the day. At night, each lighthouse received a unique color of the light and flash patterns. When first built, the light here was this cream color and flashed once per minute. So you would be able to see the light for 5 seconds and then for 55 seconds, darkness. Today, you see the light every seven and a half seconds. So that's really cool to know that every lighthouse has unique colors, patterns, light color, and frequency of the beam of light. All these are unique identifiers of each lighthouse. And as a mariner, you know where you are based on these. You see, before the age of satellites, GPS, even radio, this was a pretty genius way of navigating the waters. This section of the lighthouse is somewhat exposed and waiting to be repaired, and the whole lighthouse will be also repainted in the future. There are over 800,000 bricks used in this lighthouse. Before you enter the lighthouse, you can also take a walk towards the beach, where along the way you will come across a boathouse, and you can relax a little on the sand, which, by the way, is really nice to walk on. It's pretty soft, there is no rocks, I, I love it. You also see some remains of the past. I am not exactly sure what these were, but there was a small railroad to transport coal to the powerhouse. So these are possibly the remains of that structure. And take a look at the shells and crabs cracked open on the rocks. This possibly, not 100%, but it could be the job of seagulls. These guys pick up things like small crabs or oysters and then they drop them on something hard like rocks to crack them open and eat. To watch it, it's pretty interesting and fascinating. Until one day, you notice one of them using the roof of your car as that hard surface to crack open an oyster. Ask me how I know. And here is the line of our normal suspects. They're already looking at me like I know something. What also stood here was a hotel. It was called Surf Hotel. It was built in 1856 and it became probably the best known resort on Fire Island, especially for the rich people. However, it burned down in 1917. Here you see some cottages and buildings going back to those days of the hotel itself.
And here's some foundations of a building that used to stand here as well. When you get into the lighthouse, there is really a charming small gift shop where you can buy a ticket to go on top of the lighthouse, but don't worry, it's only $10. But at the bottom, you can also explore the lighthouse history as well. Look at this cool mini replica of the lighthouse. So let's go up 182 steps. You have windows on the way up to provide light, and hence you see the stairs have holes in them, because before electricity in 1938, you would have lots of light coming in from the windows. Otherwise, it would be really dark here inside if the stairs would be completely covered. Another genius design. I could not turn back now and I got up to the fourth window where we see a boathouse and a flagpole. By the way, the height of that flagpole is about the height of the first lighthouse. And the fifth window. One thing I did not know was that none of the windows face directly into the ocean. Because when it's dark and someone would pass by the window walking up or down the stairs, it would create a false flash of light confusing anyone observing the lighthouse from a distance. Pretty cool, I mean, everything was really thought out here. Here is a half circle where we get to walk up even more narrow steps, but we're almost on the top. And here we are. If you see the camera shaking just a little bit, it's a little bit of this gentle wind, but it's also a little bit of me pretending to be a tough guy and yet inside screaming like a child because the railing is fairly low and it is very narrow here. But oh, is it so worth it. Check out the views. On a clear day, you can even see Manhattan, which I did. Before I went down, I was also allowed to take up three more steps to look at the lights themselves, so check this out. And let me show you a little bit of these Fire Island communities. Let's see. We will walk about two and a half miles one way before returning back. And along the way, we will pass a ranger station, which opened in 1906, originally to serve as a naval radio station. And so we walk. And walk. Uh. Oh wait, I see poles with electricity. That means we are reaching our first community, Kismet. Tell me this is not beautiful here.
And look at the sand, it has this reddish shade to it. Pretty cool. In Kismet, we also have the remains of the first hotel ever built on Fire Island. It was called the Domini House, which was built in 1844. So remember, the Surf Hotel I mentioned earlier by the Lighthouse was built in 1856, so 12 years after this one. Unfortunately, this one also burned down in 1903, and these bricks are the remains of a chimney. And here we get to a dirt road again, and that means we will be crossing into our second community of Solterre, which is bigger. But each one of these really has a nice narrow path to walk on, as you see here, with homes on the side it really makes it a very pleasant walk. But you see everyone has a bike. That is the main method of transportation here. So why is it called Fire Island? Well, there's three main theories. One is that there is a poison ivy here, a plant, which turns bright red in the fall. The second theory is that back in the days, some would start fake fires to lure ships in so that they would wreck on the shore and they would loot them. So sort of like pirates working from land. And the third and final theory is that it's simply a misspelling of an old Dutch or English words. So nobody really knows for sure. There is a fire station, well, there is also a fire station in Kismet, I just didn't film everything. But you also have churches, playgrounds, restaurants, and even a market. So really anything that you would need. And look at the water, it's so beautiful and clean. See, not all of New York has dirty, polluted water. 
I had to mention this, especially after my last video about the Gowanus Canal in Brooklyn. There are places near New York City where you can really enjoy the water. I hope you enjoyed this walk with me. Those of you who are planning to visit or never been here, it is definitely a must. I highly recommend it. And I hope all of you watching are having a wonderful week. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing. And like always, I will see you next week in another New York location. Bye-bye.